this is, in some sense, a wonderfully recursive discussion. Because we're here to search, to understand how to learn, and we're here to learn how to search, and we learn how to search about learning, about searching, about learning, et cetera, right? In some sense, this is really a simple question. It's, you know, we want to see how people actually do this. So my interest is in, which is it? Is it searching to learn or learning to search? I don't care. Either works for me. So let me start by telling you about a story. A couple of years ago, I was doing an uh, ethnographic study in a lower socioeconomic area of uh, central California, up in the Sierras. And I was interviewing, and this is his description of himself, a 19-year-old unemployed snowboarder of Native American extraction. And he says, you know, I get these white patches. And this is, so this is, his, uh, this is what he looks like in the summertime. Uh, and so he gets these patches, and he's concerned about them. Interesting note, I'm watching him learn about a task that he's deeply interested in, right? I don't think you can actually do studies without watching real behavior. I love lab studies. I do them too. They are deeply limited when you're studying this particular kind of behavior. So he does this query. And this is something you may or may not have seen in your lab studies. He goes, looks at that and goes, ah, hate this. I said, why do you hate this? He says, because there's all these words on there. I have no idea what they are. They sound scary. Maybe I've got cancer. He does not read the page. I said, well, what would you now? He said, I'd give up. Do you let people in your lab give up after five seconds? Probably not. Do you, do you record the affective response? I hate this. Do you understand why? So I said, well, yeah, come on. Do one more search for me, right? And so he does this. He goes, I hate this too. It's still got scary words on it. Here's an interesting thing. When I go out and do these kinds of studies, I come to your home, I watch you search. You cannot believe the number of times I get affective responses like this. It's a remarkable number. The number of times I hear people say, I hate these results, slightly frightens me. But you know, in, in some sense, from my perspective at Google, every query is a learning opportunity. If you type in something, you're really implicitly saying, I want to learn about this. So we've done a billion different kinds of search studies trying to categorize this, the tasks, the queries, the sessions, all this stuff. Um, the latest analysis says there are nine different kinds of behaviors. You know, there are quick questions, there are complex questions, there are actions, and so on. The, the ones that you care about, I think, here today are these five. So the quick question, the complex that question, the action, ongoing research, and exploring topic. These are the learning, overtly learning behaviors. I want to know what the weather is in Vancouver tomorrow. Or I want to understand the rise of the Ottoman Empire. Right? These are very different kinds of questions, but they're all learning in some sense. So quick questions are, are simple, right? You're in, you're out. Often, people don't even click on the next result because they got their answer. We do a lot to sort of accelerate this process. Over the past five years, we've done an immense amount to make this from a one-minute problem to a five-second problem. If you're looking for more complex questions, we've started to accelerate that too. If you ask something like, you know, what's the unemployment rate in, uh, in uh, British Columbia for the past five years, we've got a, a more extended solution for you. Or exploration of things like, you know, I want to find out interesting information about notable people. I want to learn how to cook, whatever, right? One of the things we've done is to look at these sessions over the past n years and say, when people come in and they want to learn about x, what are the next five actions they take? And how can we compress those in? So I know people complain about, oh, the search engine keeps changing. That's our job. You would hate it if it was static. You really would. So we've done things like this, where if you type in uh, the Tilio, you actually end up with a knowledge panel on the right-hand side, which gives a whole bunch of information. That's not random information. It's the information we know that the next probable query is going to be. Right? And you see a few million of these kinds of queries, and a few million of the next actions, we basically compress all that up here and give it to you for free. Now, one of the things that I'm really interested in, especially with respect to this whole field, is what do people really do? I mean, I know we have lab studies. We bring them in and say, you must use five words or less 
on Google.com or whatever. Like, what do people really do? I'll tell you what, a lot of what people do is they go to YouTube. The number of millennials, and Gen X, and so on, who turn to YouTube first to answer their questions is astounding. This is in a world where these same people, 60% of them don't realize that YouTube is part of Google. They think of them as two bi completely different companies. Okay. So did you use Google today? No. Did you search for anything? Yes, I did 20 YouTube searches. OK, got it. So there's a billion of these searches related to learning activities per day on YouTube. That's a phenomenal number. That means that a third of all views on, Go on YouTube are just for learning purposes. Now keep this in mind, because every minute, 400 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube. That means during the course of this talk, we will have accepted 750 days worth of content, roughly a third of which is educational. So if you're not watching this all the time, you're behind. Right? Our world has rapidly shifted from one of information scarcity to information surfeit to a problem of information for a triage. How do you triage even the YouTube videos, even the educational videos, even the ones just on linear algebra? Right? You know how many alg linear algebra videos there are on YouTube? About 20,000. If you start now, you will be dead by the time you finish. So well, there's an interesting problem, right? 250 days of, in one hour is education content. 250 days worth of content. So this is particularly interesting because in, in our world, Khan Academy is really, really important, right? What's fascinating to know is that most people who look for Khan Academy videos go to YouTube and search for Khan Academy video quadratic equation or whatever the topic is. And they land on a YouTube video because Khan puts all of his videos in YouTube. That's his video service, right? This means every student in the world knows how to get to that kind of stuff. And it also reveals part of the problem. With that much stuff being uploaded, it's not necessarily correctly meta-tagged. Which means, if you're searching for, how do I do a faded gradient shade in Photoshop? Oh no, now you run into the version problem. Which version of Photoshop? I will tell you, most of those Photoshop tutorials don't say which version they're on. Which is a huge problem. Because not only do we change, Adobe changes too. So we spend a lot of time sort of trying to understand what happens to people in the microscopic detail and the macroscopic. Let me give you a couple moments about the microscopic. So in a sense, we, we try to model all of these costs. You know? So this is straight out of the sense making work from years ago, the cost structure of, of search, cost structure of sense making. And we think about what people do as queries, purple dots, web views, web page views as green dots, not necessarily on Google. And there's kind of a frontier. So this is where you are now, and this is what you're planning on doing next. And we have all these different factors that go into it. The key thing is the user is constantly performing this rolling evaluation. One option of which is give up, stop, right? Another option is to choose one of those. But there are interesting, interesting issues here. Do you reformulate? Do you click? Do you stop? What are those options? We've noticed that something like half of all queries, of all queries that Google sees per day, are in a long session, usually somebody trying very hard to figure something out. I don't know about you, but that's actually a big surprise. Because we have a standard distribution like that, right? Power law distribution. And what turns out is that tail is extraordinarily long. And those long queries are often people trying to figure out, so what did happen to the Ottoman Empire? And it goes one after one after one after one, right? Unfortunately, it's also a lot of people thrashing and not doing especially good query reformulations, which leads them to these long things. Another factor we've identified that might be relevant to you, particularly in educational context, context is this one down here. Uh, where is it? Dread costs. You worry about side effects. You dread doing the next query because it might break your machine. You think that's silly. There are a lot of people who worry about that. What if I do this query and I click on that button and it gives me a virus? What if it takes me to porn? 
These are all real concerns. So people have this in, in, really interesting dread cost. And when they end up on a page that they're not familiar with and they don't know quite what happens and the button labels are pretty opaque, the dread goes way up. So we also try to model and measure how people behave in these sort of mesoscales. So here, unfortunately, time goes down. You'll see why in a second. Uh, so this is one particular person who does a query for knitting patterns. They do the query up here in the purple dot. They go and visit one page, say, well, that's not quite right. That's not what I need. They reformulate the query to knitting pattern socks. And then this whole behavior, this aggregated pattern, you will see this repeated time and time again. This is somebody mining out a topic area. They have found a resource for knitting sock patterns. And they're just going click, click, download, click, click, download, click, click, download. That's a repeated pattern. You'll see that, right? Now, when you start looking around, you'll start to see these repeated patterns. And these are all people doing specific educational goals. Now, I'm trying to learn about how to make up my socks. I'm learning how to methodically work through an information space. This sucks, right? This is bad. Um, this is somebody multitasking, right? They're trying to do socks, but then they switch over to, you know, what does it actually mean to work with acrylic yarn as opposed to wool? So they're doing, they're breaking up into these things. Typically, this is not a good, good path. But we see these patterns repeated. When you look at lots of these patterns in the aggregate, you start to see the kinds of goals and the kinds of sessions that, the, that those things entail. So I will tell you, navigational, we basically have that one wired. You, get, you do a query, you get a nav result, you're done. That's done. We, we, we tackled that one and succeeded. When people are looking for resource, that's pretty good too. When people are looking for that particular video, got that. This is where the interesting education stuff is, is that when people are trying to learn about a particular topic. So they do all these behaviors in order to try to learn with respect to what they know, which makes it really hard for assessment. I mean, this is the classic problem in searching and learning. What does the person already know? Our, our perspective on running user tests for this is to ask them about things nobody could possibly know, and we give them the pretest. If you score more than 10%, we flush you out. What are the politics of Baku in 1968? Nobody knows about that. Right? We have a corpus for that. right? So that's one approach to it. But like I said, we're also really interested in how people actually behave in the large, okay? So here's a task we gave people a while ago was to find a particular projector to, to buy for home. This is the search part. This is depressing to me. But roughly, when you actually look at real behaviors that are not scoped down to artificial boundaries, search is less than 20% of the total task. Search is less than 20%. Okay, so what's all this other stuff? It's checking out the vendors, it's checking out the retailers. The search part, people learning what those vendors are, what those retailers are, and then going and doing the acquisition from there. So it's not bad enough that that's the only problem we have. We have another problem here. This is a little video without audio, so I'm just good. This is actually from one of our, our setups, and this is an eye tracking video. It's an eye tracker we built, so uh, you can't run this. Uh, but anyway, so here's the presentation of the task. It's basically, you want to buy flowers. And the person does the search. I'm going to skip forward here. They do flowers. And watch their track here. Now, this is just on the regular search page. They click on the second ad. It's fine. They get here. And at this point, I say, what are you doing? Tell me what you're thinking about. Notice the eye doesn't stop moving. The eye never stops moving. They're reading as they're talking to me. There you keep reading. So this is what we call ancillary learning. It's learning along the way. People do not necessarily follow the protocol to the letter that you would like them to. They learn all kinds of stuff that you didn't plan for them to learn. And so this becomes a real problem with speak aloud protocol studies. Because as they're speaking, their eyes do not stop moving. And often they're learning terms, names, organizations, places, all that stuff, when you think they're not doing anything else, nobody just turns their brain off to talk. They keep looking, they keep doing that. So it's an interesting issue for us. And it also leads us to think about other kinds of situations because we're not, surprise, surprise, we're not just a US company. 
Um, India is a big market for us. So we've done a lot of studies where we've done uh, experience sample method studies. And you can do the math. Uh, our sample size is a little over 2,000 people over a couple weeks. We asked them four questions a day about this, asking what are your information needs? We're trying to figure out how do they think about what they need to learn about? What do you need to know? So um, here's an interesting, interesting result. Uh, education needs, that is somebody saying, I need to learn something for an educational purpose, are larger by almost twice in India than in the US. That's interesting. So what does that say? It says we should be thinking about how can we twerk Google search around to support education, explicit queries in India. Furthermore, um, if you look here, classroom, classroom learning versus education planning. This is a category I didn't even know existed. But it turns out in India, the need for classroom learning objectives, searches on Google, is much less than it is for education planning. Turns out, she's shaking her head. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. Which classes do I need to take in order to get to this, right? That turns out to be a huge deal. Okay. So when you break it down by economic category, uh, the really interesting thing here, it's a little surprising, is that if you look at education planning, the middle class dominates here. Right? Fascinating, fascinating result. But what it tells us is what we think of in North America may or may not apply for planning and search monitoring and search provision in India. And it's different yet again in Indonesia. It's different yet again in Brazil. You see where this is going? One size does not fit all. Right? Furthermore, the search behaviors in India are different than they are in the US, and so on. Right? Be very ethnocentrically careful when you do your studies. Well, using you know, the weird population right, is may or may not tell you what's actually happening. You may not have discovered a search universal. You may have discovered something that works only in British Columbia or only north of, you know, Texas. Yes, exactly, exactly right. So we've seen this in other contexts, but this is a really interesting diagram. So this is Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And from the same study, we were asking, you did a search for what? Um, I needed a Hindu devotional Sanskrit slogan, slogan with meaning. I love that search. But more to the point, it was for my son, it wasn't for me. This is, 27-year-old housewife in Chennai, right? T takeaway, not all searches are for you. Moms, you know this is true, right? Right, so we have a laptop at home. If, if Google tried to characterize who uses that laptop, it would be the intersection of me, my son, my daughter, and my wife. So both interested in, in basketball and in the politics of Palo Alto. Interested in linguistics, and interested in the deep issues of computer science. Who is that person? It's not one person, it's a union. So this is an interesting question about the reality of how people search. So we thought we'd be smart. And a few years ago, we built something in Google called the, the reading level filter. So you could actually select, you could do a search, say, for Egypt, and then click on basic, advanced, or intermediate. And it would then give you results that were appropriate to that reading level. Worked really well. We had a really great model. Fantastic. We discontinued it after a couple of years. Teachers loved it, but there were not enough teachers who clicked on the results to actually pay for the storage. Right? We ran ads against all this stuff, but if only 1,000 people a day click on that, we can't pay for the storage or the analysis. So it's a money-losing proposition. So we have to think about how we re-engineer the system in order to sustain its own use. So we're, like I said, really interested in how people actually versus theoretically versus hypothetically use these systems. How do they actually learn from search engines? So a while ago, we did another study where we said, uh, look, we're going to track you minute by minute while you write this paper. And we actually got people and said, what are you going to do? So this is a breakdown, sort of minute by minute, over 12 different categories of what they did. And here's an assembly of, uh, I think, a dozen different things. Uh, interesting. 
it's really hard to discern the pattern there. Bottom line, if you get enough people, there is no pattern there. What's going on? I mean, it sort of annoys me as a cognitive psychologist, right? That there should be patterns. But the truth is, individuals actually have very, very different search behaviors. So remember those patterns I showed you earlier? Kathy only uses the mining one, right? Rebecca only uses the, the, the going deep one. And so we discover that there are many of these different patterns. And what's more, each individual has a kind of style. You know you have a style when you drive. It's not a surprise you have a style when you search. So people have preferential behaviors that they exercise as they do these tasks. The other thing we found, which I, I frankly didn't, didn't know about until we started analyzing the data, and we got these big differences in performance. It's like, what is going on? It took us probably a month to figure out that there are native, native readers and non-native readers. And their pattern of search analysis and behavior and learning is very, very different. That was a profound finding for us. We also discovered, not surprisingly, that the ability to find high quality content also varied. When I first came to Google, about two weeks into my tenure, I ran into Larry Page in the hallway. He says, so why are you here again? That's not a good question to hear from your boss. Um, and I said, explain what I'm doing is I'm studying how people search, how they use how they search and so on. He said, well, it's obvious to me. After two weeks, they become experts. Really? So I said, well, I'll study that and get back to you about that. Um, 13 years later, I'm still studying this. So clearly, Larry was wrong. <laughs> I mean, profoundly wrong, right? I mean, I can tell you a lot about that. That's a whole separate talk. But there's, here's some of the th things we found. Individual behaviors, contrastive kinds of uses, things about how different people use different kinds of systems, and so on. So it's interesting to watch students as they work because they live in these really interesting environments. And so one of the things we did is we, we started watching the students working for a while, writing papers and doing whatever. And that led us, uh, one of my uh, interns and I, to write this, this system called Doc Matrix. The observation was lots of things, there's a lot of things online, and you know, at people at Google, they've got like four or five monitors each, and you probably do two, and you've got multiple windows. And so you have a, pl a plethora of documents, right? And it's a pain because they're not connected. So we built this thing called Doc Matrix, which allows you to actually do a query over the Google Books corpus and see up to 40 different volumes on the same topic. And in particular, we would mine the table of contents for this. If you're an autodidact, this is gold. Because the collection of tables of contents of books on a topic that you care about structures the knowledge space, right? What would, what would you do if you could actually see 40 side by side? And furthermore, you, oh, I'll just show you part of it. I'm going to see if we get sound here. It's, it's pretty, pretty common for advanced oh, yeah. learners cool. to refer I'm to I'm still going to skip forward. At the same so there's that picture. When you do a typical Google no search on books, you get a bunch of books in the list view. Access. It doesn't work so well. These right? books have so we now have them like this. this cards, each with a display area with widgets to let you read, scroll, and search within the book. So each one of these Clicking is like on an independent the browser. Toggle but on and off the table of contents view for all of the books in the collection. We now can see the table of contents for all these side by side. And we can also look at the list of common terms that appear we across all, all of the tables of contents in this collection to get a sense of what side. this entire set so of books is. So you can say, show me all the ones that talk about ring theory, or the ones that talk about algebra, unit theory, or whatever. Groups and, and you get this very nice way of looking at terms show here. All and you can search and scroll and blah, 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 and you can remove Here, volumes and all that. The, the point group. is that we got this out of the observations of real students using real books. So that was interesting to see. So we built this very cool, works really well. We cannot get books people to adopt it. It's expensive, it's slow. How many students are actually going to use it? They say, remember reading filter? Hmm. So we're fighting an uphill battle here. And it's an interesting problem. We have this prog complex pretty problem for advanced Let me get go forward. Where we have students who are not just reading books and not just looking at the technology of the past, 
But um, truth, uh, truth in Lending, uh, that's my daughter. Uh, she's actually using that book, and she's actually using her iPhones. And I said, kid, what are you doing? Do not listen to music while you're studying. She said, dad, I roll. I'm listening to Turkish radio. And so she was hearing the sounds of the language as she was studying Turkish grammar. I'll give you that one. Okay, that was good. Uh, but then the next day, um, the next day, you know, I uh, snuck up. She was uh, sitting outside using her phone, and she was actually studying Icelandic, conversational Icelandic. Uh, and the interesting thing about that is not that my daughter's brilliant; she's very smart. But the interesting thing is, where does that sit in the library? Where does that sit? How do you find these things? You know the answer. She went online and said, app for conversational Icelandic. So her search for learning brought her to an app that she downloaded to her phone. That's a phenomenal thing. It's also off of Google. We don't make this. All right? So I'm really interested in this, the whole spectrum of behavior, what people actually do and not what I sort of wish they would do. They often download apps. So here's a key idea for today, which is um, I want to think about not information literacy, but what I'm going to term informacy, which is thinking about information as a first class object. Because too often, information literacy means you know how to use Excel. That's not what I mean. You cannot conjugate information literacy. But you can kind of conjugate this, right? So it's really knowing how to use and interact with information. It's understanding what metadata is. It's understanding what a corpus is, what information resources are, that kind of stuff. That's what I care about. I suspect that's what you care about. So let me tell you three key things here. There's a whole, whole long class I could give on this. I'll tell you three key ideas. Here's a pe first piece of informacy. What's possible to find? I don't know about you, but I ask my students this all the time. What's possible to find? Almost universally, they say, well, anything. And I say, well, let's test that, right? And it's pretty easy to come up with a query where they actually can't find anything. So I think an informant student needs to understand not only what the space of possibility is, but what the access paths are to get to that. So how would you find? a PowerPoint template about superconducting physics for high school students. File type colon PPT or file type PPTX, et cetera, et cetera, right? Unless you know those, it, just knowing how to use Excel kind of doesn't help. So informacy is this sort of deeper understanding of what's possible, how to do things. There's also the, um, if it's not on Google effect, right? Google is the universe effect. Uh, how many times have you had students say, I search for it on Google, it doesn't exist. It's not there. This is a huge problem. It's a huge, huge problem. So here in this wood, I love this woodcut because it illustrates this problem of trying to poke your head outside of the known space, the known universe, trying to see beyond into the celestial spheres. An example. This is actually from my book. This is chapter 17. <laughs> um, uh, nice example. I was visiting Delos, which is roughly there in Italy. Again. Beautiful Greek temples and, and homes and all that stuff, and gorgeous stuff. And this is the pediment of the statue of Apollo that was destroyed. And tour guide says, you know, this is kind of cool. Look at all the 19th century graffiti on it. It's a little hard to see in the light here. But, but if you look carefully, here it says M.C. Perry, U.S.N. 1826. Now, I know a little bit about M.C. Perry. And I thought, oh, wow, is it that M.C. Perry? And the Greek tour guide said, I do not know about your MC Perry. <laughs> Great. So I looked it up. And I'm trying to figure out, did, did he really go to Delos in 1826? How would you find out? Let me tell you, Google's not going to solve this problem for you. That's the, that's the foreshadowing. But I was able to do some things that led me to the method to solve the problem. Start with the obvious query, right? A couple of books later, I find out that he was actually on the USS North Carolina, and there's a logbook. Unfortunately, that's the wrong year. So I go working a little bit more through Google Books, and I discover that, in fact, there was a, a, a not only a logbook, but there was a letter book from that time period. And I discovered I had to go to the Stanford Rare Books room because uh, it's in partial view. 
see where I'm heading with this? As an informant searcher, that is, as a sophisticated learner, you need to know all this stuff. You need to know that I can click on find in a library here. And luckily, it said, oh, it's at Stanford Library. I hopped on my bike and I rode over there. I got to that thing and it said, here's the accession number for the logbook. <sighs> Where's the logbook? Oh, it's in Delaware. Great. So next time I was in Delaware, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of the steps here for the interest of time. But this is enormously fun. It also took me three months to do this. Three months in a universe where Generation X bails on a search if it takes more than two minutes. Right? The average search time is less than seven minutes. Okay? So I took months to do this. I ultimately got to the logbook. This is awesome. Down here, it says, standing next to Delos, right? They're there for four hours. But I don't know if they got off the boat. How would I figure that part out? So I'm acting like a fact checker slash print PI, right? So at any rate, I'm going to skip a bunch more. I finally ended up at the Library of Congress, where I went to the Library of Congress archives. I have my archive card, and I look at the logbooks. All they've got two more, same problem. They say they were there, but they don't say anything else. If you're an archivist, you now know what to say. I didn't know what to do. But the archivist, bless his heart, came over and said, I think you should read the letters. Oh, oh, well, what would that be? So we bring out the boxes, and we start reading the letters. And sure enough, that letter by the captain of the boat to his wife, Minerva, in Washington, D.C., says, blah, 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 we're there. We stopped at Delos. We spent four days digging each island doing broken comb, blah, blah, and at the very last line, including two altars from the temples of Diana and Apollo on Delos. Smoking gun. I got it. Three months, four archives, right? See what this is? Not only am I telling you this story as an example, it's not to make, you know, show you how clever I am, uh, but it's to show you that sometimes you need to be persistent. It's not obvious how to go from point one to point two to point three. And the deeper point really is it's not just about the behavior of search engines. Sometimes it's this other stuff you have to do, along with the informant skill that knowing that A, there are archives, B, they have indices. <coughs> Sometimes not all archives have finding aids. You probably have noticed this, right? So you still need to know stuff. Google does not relieve you of the responsibility of knowing how to search or knowing that there are resources in the world. So I started making this sort of list of things I think an informant searcher should know. This is an infinite list, but you know, just to give you some idea, you need to know, for example, that there is a thing called the New Grove Dictionary of Music Musicians, or Burke's Peerage and Gentry. You need to know how to get to archival content, then that there are these different con content genres, right? Because if you're even a smart searcher and you're searching for Angkor Wat, this is the Google Cultural Institute's page on Angkor Wat. It has 3D models of Angkor Wat, sub-millimeter resolution. Incredible resource. It's on page five of the research results. Nobody finds it on Google, which is deeply ironic, I understand, but it's true, right? Likewise, we have an amazing, amazing newspaper archive collection that virtually nobody uses. I'm keeping it alive myself, basically. Uh, but we have this incredible thing. Do you know how to get there? Do you know how to get there? Right. So this problem is not just our archive. Library of Congress has this incredible resource called Chronicling America, which is a great collection, but not, ex not complete coverage of U US archival stuff. And the Library of Congress also has this immense collection of copyright-free imagery. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's a great resource. You know how to get there. I know how to get there. No student knows how to get there. They don't even know it exists. If you don't know that Atlantis exists, you won't go searching for it. You know what I mean. Do you know that we have all these wonderful data sets that have been validated and updated constantly? You can search for unemployment rate in Maryland. And it will not only give you Maryland, but it will also anticipate your next queries, which is I want to contrast it not with just you, but also with California, because I'm in California, and Florida, because that's the most contrasted unemployment data set. The real point here is we, as a culture, 
are not good about transmitting our cultural knowledge. And yet, I think the youth, the students that we all teach, are not great about understanding that you need to know this stuff. You can't just get by without it. And here's a nice example. In the little video, I want you to listen to what he says. The pink dot is another eye tracking thing. Don't worry about it. Um, the question I asked him was, um, can you find me something to do in San Francisco on Saturday night? Just some activity, just something for fun. Listen to what he says. So I can find my mouse. There we go. So, yeah, I want to try and do one last thing. Okay. Can we do pink? Okay. Reasonable quiz. I see what happened. I'm activities for kids. Oh, see? They're not giving me a chance, man. They're always for kids. No wonder I could have find. So you should type adult. Okay. TVs. See? That's what I mean. So it's really hard to search for these activities. I'm going to stop the video there because the next query is adult activities, San Francisco, Saturday night. <laughs> I can't show you that. I do not recommend you search for it now. Do it at home. But this is funny. Why? Because he clearly does not understand what the internet is really for. He does not understand. In particular, he would not be doing that query in front of Laura, my research person who's sitting there, and if, you, if he knew what was coming next, he wouldn't have done that query, right? There are dragons in the internet. How is it possible he doesn't know that? What else do we not know that we should? So here's the thing. When you actually start studying real users, you find some striking results. So how often do people search, and I'm not including you in this, or your students, or anybody in university, how often on average do people search? Guesses? Um, well, <laughs> I'll tell you that in a second. But what I want to show you is the first thing we asked, yeah, asked them was how often, how confident were you in your searches? Bottom line is 92% of people say, this is a sample size of you know, like 10,000, um, 92 are confident in their ability to search, and yet 66% search less than one time per day. I've got endless amounts of data for this. This is, um, this is over like a couple million people, right? 66% search less than once a day. You don't get good at anything doing it less than once a day, okay? Especially since they spend only a couple of minutes. Another fundamental skill you would think that searchers would have is the ability to search for text on a page, right? You all know how to do it. Control F or Command F. So when I ask people, how long on this web page did Beth Smith take to run this race, a quarter of them got the answer wrong. How is that possible? It's possible because they don't know Control F. Well, it turns out they can't also copy and paste the number from the web page to, into my spreadsheet. They tried to remember the number and they just got a digit swapped or something. They also don't know control C, control V. Where have we failed as a culture? Because this is not just, uh, this is not optional. If you don't know this, what else do you not know? So I was curious about that. So I surveyed uh, 2,000 uh, English internet users, 90% do not know this. Of, of English teachers in the US, half do not know it. These are people who have credentials, presumably. Firefox users, 93%. I can go on. This means your students, probably some of them, don't know it. Your mom doesn't know it. Your brother doesn't know it. Do your kids know this? Right? I've given talks like this at, at well-known universities where people in the computer science department did not know this. How do you function? Now, it's a real question. How do you actually operate? And the answer is they waste a huge amount of time. So in another study, we discovered that we can reduce the amount of time you search by 12%. We would kill for 1%. If you know this one skill, it's 12%. So it's a huge difference. And what I find so fascinating is people say to me, how am I supposed to know this? Well, you see it every time you click on the edit menu. On any app, there's always a find option here. And mere exposure, even in the thousands, is not enough to teach you what that thing does. Exposure is not the same as instruction. 
right? Do not confuse the two. So this is important because we have things that we have to worry about, like you know the conventions of, of our social media environment. So you all know the spoof sites, right? Like the Tree Octopus. Or this site, RYT Hospital. Looks great. Actually will take your credit card. There's a phone number you can call it and everything. Only when you get to the page about male pregnancy do you start to worry about it. <laughs> and of course now we live in an environment of fake news, right? So here's a, 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 an article about gay baboon terrorizes villagers in South Africa. It's an unfortunate article. Um, and if you do an easy quoted search in the title, you quickly find it's a satirical piece written by a guy who said, I can earn hundreds of dollars writing articles like this. My point, if you don't know control F, you probably don't know that either. You don't know enough to be skeptical. How do we help? How can we help? When you see something like this, What's your response? This is on CNN. So why are you laughing? The Holy Father is just a miracle. You've seen it on CNN. It must be true. Why are you skeptical, doubting Thomases? Or this, my aunt sent me this with, on Facebook. You want to see this in the news. Um, uh, when you zoom in, you can quickly see he's not rescuing him. He's handing him a MAGA hat. Or Sarah Sanders. Uh, yeah, that video too. Yeah, exactly. Question, how would your students debunk this or what? Do they have to have photogrammetry skills now? Well, it's not hard. Or you just zoom in, right? You can see he's handing him a hat. He's actually not rescuing him. Here, dude, have a hat. Have a good day. This is deeply important. Because there's all kinds of social skills that we take for granted, we don't think about. We have the curse of too much knowledge, you and I. And so I found this example on a, on a QA site where there's a true Rosa Parks who could move to the back of the bus, but she was listening to her iPod. The best, the best answer chosen by the asker is, yeah, it's true. Two people rated this as good. The asker gave the answerer five stars. Thank you, I'll put that in my report. I trust you, you have the nicest avatar. <laughs> what went wrong? The asker did not understand what that symbol meant. You, as sophisticated emoticon readers, know that's sarcasm. It's a fake answer. I'm pulling your leg. If you don't have that little piece of culture, you'll get fooled every time. Right? I love the bit at the end. I trust you, you have the nicest avatar. The beauty of an avatar is no basis for credibility assessment. So this kind of stuff gets to all of us, in particular in an age when content resources and accessor methods change radically, moment by moment. So a while ago, my son asked me uh, a question, which was that he likes to go to Stanford basketball games. He loves this song where everybody starts chanting, and you've probably heard it before. It's this song. You might have sung this song. And he said to me, Dad, how do I find this song? You get the idea, right? Great idea, it won't work. It won't work, why? Because it's a thousand drunken Stanford fans screaming at the top of their lungs. And SoundHound and all of those digital media search methods work off of the recorded version, not the audio captured version, right? So it will match, okay? So he says, Dad, you work at Google, help me. And I'm thinking, I think, well, maybe we'll do lyric search. What are the lyrics? Oh, all yeah, right. Oh, I think, oh man, you're screwed. Give up. So, being my son, he immediately goes to Google and types in oh, 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 oh. And you see the first suggestion there? He now has that phone, that song on his phone. What did I get wrong? I did not understand the rise of QA sites. They are deeply important in our information ecology. And I blinked and I missed it. He discovered that. And now it's a strategy for me, right? You can ask questions like that and get answers. So uh, one of the informant skills is this sort of ability to be curious and be able to ask questions. So for example, when I talk to English teachers and librarians, I often say, Did, have you read this book? And all of them have said, well, of course I read that book. What does the title mean? 
almost uniformly, people will say, oh, that's the one about the, the Nautilus, the submarine, and that's how deep the submarine went. And they, it was like a sixth grade teacher. That's how deep, right? And I say, well, what is a league? They say, well, it's a unit of measurement. What unit of measurement? Are you curious about this? So I looked up league, and I discovered it's about three miles. I did one search, and then I said, what's 20,000 leagues in miles? It's 69, you, you convert to kilometers, right? Um, 69,000 miles. So second question, that seems big to me. What's the diameter of the Earth? You have a problem. You did not understand the title. What went wrong? Well, you didn't ask the obvious question. I don't know what a league is. But rather than admit that, they just gloss over it. People do this all the time. Learning how to ask these questions is not optional. It's a required skill. And there are ways to ask better questions and poorer questions. For example, another kind of problem that comes up all the time, like with the Pope miracle, or with the other one we saw, you have to assess the quality of a site. Somebody sends me this site and says, seems weird to me. EPA, why are they writing articles like, the EPA gives guilty pleasure a new name? That seems weird. Why, do I, should I trust this site? Question for you. What would you do now? Well, what I did is I searched their about text. It's the project, the Environmental Policy Alliance. I think, wait a second. It doesn't sound right to me. What's EPA read? OK. I'm going to check it out. And I discovered, oh, Environmental Protection Agency. That's their logo. And you look at the logo side by side. You think, wait a second. They're trying to pull a fast one here by consciously spoofing the logos to be similar. So what's next? Well, what I did is I searched the, the street address, the Environmental Policy Alliance, trying to validate that it makes sense. I'll do what I can. I'm close. I'm only like 30 slides away, so I can do it. Um, it's at Washington, D.C., Northwest. That's all that sounds right. If you then copy paste that address into Google, it will then say, oh, by the way, this is also at that same street address and same suite number. The EPA I know is bigger than one suite, but whatever. So I search for those guys. Who's Berman and Company? Turns out they are a lobbying agency. And they happen to be a lobbyist for big, big oil, big ag, big farm, and so on. And they're in the same address. Okay. Turns out, now here's the thing, key notion, 80% of students in the university cannot do that. This is work by Sam Weinberg at Stanford. 80% of graduate students can't do this. Right? So it concerns me because we have the, live in this interesting time, this quality quantity paradox. What should we be doing to help support learning through search? I would argue that we've got a lot of things to do. But the question for us in this workshop is, what should we be doing? What do we want to do? We want to just describe what we see people doing. We want to build tools to help them out. What do you want to change in the world? So you remember this, this problem, white patches on cheeks? I just made this up this morning, right? One tool might be to put a little S up there, simplify the text. I have no idea what this means. Just give me a simple version of it. This is a great research problem. So that when you click on that, it actually rewrites that text according to like a simple PDF kind of algorithm. We don't have that now. Great idea. So what I think we should be doing next is teaching how to learn. As you know, the rate of knowledge turnover is so high these days that a lot of what you learn or what your students learn is going to be invalid, out of date, useless in five years. Right? I know my knowledge of immunology, which I learned back in the 70s, is 100% useless. Right? We need to explicitly teach metacognition. People do not figure this stuff out on their own. Autodidacts are incredibly rare. That's part of the reason we did the doc matrix thing with the table of contents, to expose that. We need to help our learners become very much better by doing, teaching them explicitly about resources and, and methods and so on. So I did this MOOC uh, three years ago uh, called Power Searching with Google. And I've had 4 million students go through it. And his is the best chart of my entire professional career. The reason this is the best chart is this is the pre-period, two weeks before, during the period, and post-period. 
And with the black, just look at the, at the red line here. They come in at four, they get better, they go up to about eight. And this is over like 100,000 student population. They go back down to about 0.6. That's still three what they were when they came in. Yay! Our change is persistent. And you're kidding yourself if you don't think that diminution after the end of the class it doesn't happen for your class. It totally happens in your classes. I just happened to chart it out. Um, but what's interesting, more interesting, is that six months afterwards, we did a survey with all these people, and we got about a 50% hit rate, return rate, which is phenomenal. Um, but they said that they were all doing more complex tasks now. That change is persistent. It also indicates that this is possible. We didn't discuss metacognition here. I want to do a MOOC on metacognition. Right? I also have a blog. I do the same kind of thing here. I teach this. And I think where we have to go is sort of end up by teaching the skills and knowledge. So here are four different kinds of pieces of knowledge we need to explicitly give our students. What's possible to find, knowing the content changes, the search tools themselves change, and different kinds of skills. How do you search for a tool? How would you search for that app to teach you conversational Icelandic? So there's a lot to say here. I'm going to wrap it up in the last slide. Um, these research skills, at their best, can build, build a kind of nuanced understanding. It definitely improves students' ability to learn. What I find so interesting, though, is these kind of outside-of-the-box solutions, these outs beyond Google interesting things. So a couple of years ago, I was teaching um, a group of fourth graders. And I taught is a very diverse classroom. So I taught them how to use Google Translate. And because it's fourth graders, a couple weeks later, I got a big package of letters from the students saying, thank you, Dr. Russell, for showing us blah, blah, blah. And Armando, a little boy named Armando, said, thank you for teaching me how to use Google Translate. My parents don't want me to learn Spanish, but his grandmother lives in Honduras. For them, it's a downwardly mobile language, but he still has an abuela in Honduras he wanted to write to. So he now is a little bit more informant than he was before. I hope he's picked up a little bit of the metacognitive things as well. But I think this is the way we have to go. Thank you very much. <laughs>